Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Juno Diaz. Thank you. Welcome to Copenhagen. How do you feel? Oh, it's always nice to be back. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. When were you first here? Um, December 2007, and then um, the summer of 2011. Yeah. You know us well. I don't know anything about that, but uh, <laughs> I've been here twice, yeah. Do you know, Diaz, we're sitting here and we're in a building that's about six million books lying around somewhere out there. It's a big library, and I know that you're a total bookworm. How do you feel about libraries like this? Oh, it's very comforting, you know? But I, yeah, I think these days libraries uh, immediately provoke the question about how's the funding, you know? <laughs> Because uh, in the States, we have this wonderful tradition of free public libraries, but they're desperately underfunded. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm one of those kids who, uh, when I think of uh, the central institutions that uh, help shape me, uh, the library is certainly primary among them. Uh, it's good places. If you're going to grow up in any of these kind of crazy places, it's probably best to grow up inside of a library. Mm -hmm. And I sort of did, you know. You know. And look where it got you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if my family's pleased, but it got me somewhere. You know? <laughs> what would Junior feel about sitting here in the library? Well, I mean, the one thing about writing characters is that uh, it's really easy to write people who are smarter than you. You just look shit up, you know? <laughs> so he's a person who's, as a character, as a kind of a, a sort of a, you know, a narratological figure, he's a lot smarter than me. So uh, I'm sure if I thought about it, he would be delighted, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure he's as delighted as I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but, He'd be uh, a little more skeptical, wouldn't he? <laughs> I think I'm more skeptical than him, but... Uh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, not because I, I necessarily have skepticism as a kind of an operational code. Um, it's just that being a visitor always gives you a skewed relationship to any place. Um, when you just cruise through something, you barely see anything. And I remember how many times it was when... I would work inside of an institution and um, folks would come and visit and they would be like, ah, oh, this shit is great. And you're at the job thinking, I'm gonna fucking burn this place down. <laughs> First chance I get. So, you know, the disparities between being inside and just sort of uh, being a guest is always stark. Mm -hmm. I guess I just wanted to mention Junior because um, he's such a steady sort of figure in, in your writing. And uh, as Lisa just said, you uh, have agreed to come here and talk to us in the context of a whole series of talks and activities that have the topics of migration, colonialism, racism, all these themes that have been acutely present for some people for many years, but that seem to have become also acutely present for some of us who have been in the privileged position of, of not having to think too much about those themes until recently. It seems like something is going on where it's uh, becoming more central even to people who could brush off these themes earlier on. Anyway, what I wanted to say with this was that these are very conflicted topics. They're full of anger, division, controversy around them. But to me, literature, and I think your works are great examples of this, can oftentimes make us understand questions about migration, colonialism, racism, in ways that are more fruitful than discussions are sometimes. So this leads to a question, and it is when you became an author, when Junior and Oscar Wao and Lola were born, were you conscious that you wanted to tell stories that were, would also address these themes? Yeah, I mean, most certainly. I, uh, I was a... Um, um, I was someone who was obsessed uh, with the Caribbean as 
a spatiality of forgetting. Um, to be someone who's born and raised in the Caribbean means that you grow up in the heart of perhaps the greatest amnesia that the world has ever um, inflicted upon itself. And an amnesia that's lived not only at an international level, but it's lived locally. Um, the average person I grew up with uh, wasn't exactly interested in reviewing or rehearsing um, sort of the most uh, traumatic parts of our history. Um, that's, that wasn't on the table. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't part of the, you know, the lunchbox. Uh, I, I was very, very interested in this. I think I was one of these kids who, through certain turns in my life, uh, I was given to certain kinds of exposures that made me vulnerable to these histories. I had a grandfather who um, uh, seemed to have a, an invested interest in making sure that before his grandchildren left the island for the United States, that they had certain things in their mind um, and certain recollections. And so uh, my grandfather wanted to make sure that we understood that we were children of African descent, that we had been the descendants, that we were the descendants of slaves, that uh, slavery was an infinite cruelty from which the world uh, had yet to begun to reckon. And this, of course, is my interpretation now as an adult when I think about some of the crazy shit my grandfather was doing. In some ways, he was a lot smarter than uh, anyone that I knew growing up was because he sort of came at these things symbolically. You know, I think he understood uh, something about children that I still have come to terms with, which is, you know, he understood that we would remember symbols in ways that we would not remember um, perhaps even language. And uh, I still remember my grandfather. We were at a, at a sugar cane field. Uh, my grandfather worked a sugar cane field almost his entire life. He worked coffee. He worked all of the kind of the consumer drugs of the new world that... Uh, sort of um, underwrote uh, the new world's early wealth. And I still remember this so clearly, I couldn't have been but five years old, and uh, he showed um, us the, you know, uh, chains that, uh, uh, that they would uh, um, put on the enslaved Africans. And I still remember him showing this to us and him saying, um, yes, uh, this is what they used to put you in. And as a kid, I was kind of like, what the fuck is he talking about, man? You know, you, you don't... I'm a free man. <laughs> but also, you're like, I don't know what the hell, I don't got the context for this. But it was a mysterious moment that began to make sense to me the older I got and the more that I studied. And so therefore, you know, start there and I become a history major at my public university. Uh, this was back in the day when public universities in the United States were still affordable. Um, you know, and you could, in the United States, it's quite different from perhaps some place like Denmark, but in the United States at that time, you could actually, as someone like me, could actually work a regular job and pay my university and not go entirely insane. And so I was at this university and um, I, my area of studies was, um, enslavement in the Caribbean and uh, maroon communities in the Black Atlantic. And this was before I began to write any kind of literature. So long way of saying that uh, in some ways, a lot of my interests that ended up being reflected in a, you know, hopefully a subtle way in the literature um, came out of a premeditated study of these, um, these histories. And it almost sounds like it's a recovering of yourself in a way, because you say that you're born into a speciality of forgetting. So it almost sounds like this is a, a lost memory that you're working on recuperating. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would have ever engaged in it if it wasn't for the fact that, uh, 
you know, the United States and by extension Europe are so gleefully committed to not remembering shit. <laughs> you know, it's like fantastic. I mean, this, the amount of energy that Europe and North America and by extension the other settler colonies like Israel and um, Australia and New Zealand expend unseeing reality. Uh, Jesus Christ, you could move Jupiter into another galaxy. It's like a tremendous amount of energy. And I think when you encounter that, uh, that sort of systematic and robust politics of amnesia, um, for me, it was very striking. And in some ways, it also made me curious. Why were a fucking American so goddamn obsessed with Columbus, but so disinterested in the sites which he quote unquote discovered slash colonized destroyed. In one sense, there was this, what we would call forgetting to remember, you know, or remembering to forget. Columbus stands there as a device that helps them forget even more. And that was really curious and for me of great interest because it helps in some ways, um, as an artist, um, it's really useful as an artist to know what the culture wishes to abolish, right? Because as an artist, you're not interested in... The artist who's interested in reminding the culture what it fucking knows is in for a long week, <laughs> you know? Uh, you're, if you're going to do any productive work as an artist, you're going to go the places where everyone is strenuously trying not to look. And um, certainly, uh, for those of us of African descent, for those of us from the Caribbean, we are the grammar in which the new world forgets. Um, if the whole new world, by we mean this world since enslavement, um, if it has an operating system, it is written in the zeros and ones of enslaved Africans. We forget everything based on the technologies of forgetting that we first implemented with forgetting the great crimes in the new world. And this was, a, as an artist, it was both useful personally, but also, I think, important for my own um, aesthetics, you know, because you can do really I would argue interesting work if you're interested in your cultures um, in a sort of uh, curious way. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to move on to American mainland in just a second, but I just want you to talk a little bit more about the Caribbean and forgetting in the Caribbean. What is it? What is that society in which this very active forgetting is going on all the time, except perhaps with your granddad. What does that do to a country or a society in which kids grow up? Well, I mean, I don't want to kind of paint my grandfather as some special person just because I'm related to him. I think that there's a, a whole ton of people who, you know, are very uh, invested in trying to recall and trying to keep alive and trying to mark and trying to kind of archive Uh, on many, many different levels. It's been, in some ways, one of the most important branches of Caribbean epistemology. Um, when we think, if we think of modernity as organized uh, around the terms of forgetting and the terms of what um, uh, is described as coloniality, that there's been a, a kind of a counter modernity, which includes some of these things that are happening in the Caribbean. Um, but uh, I tell you, uh, oh, I, look, we're in Denmark, you know? Fuck if anybody remembers there was a Danish Caribbean. You know, even in the Caribbean, a lot of people don't remember there's a fucking Danish Caribbean. Uh, I used to date this woman from St. Thomas. Her grandfather was named Ulrich. I was like, oh shit, there was a Danish Caribbean. <laughs> Yep. You know, and if you can have those encounters, perhaps it sparks it. But, uh, you know, it, it matters quite a bit um, that uh, 
we have these extraordinarily complex histories that make so many of us complicit in so much fucked up shit, man. I, I think it's significant because after all, what is contemporary status policies or status politics if not? In other words, you guys, are, you're all in the middle of an election, right? Yes, a uh, local election. Election, I mean, yeah. local, state, larger federal. Ultimately, few politicians are making vast arguments for complexity. Y'all have a wider arrangement of political parties. Therefore, perhaps you have some candidates that are making arguments for complexity. Complexity is what you need to be able to hold these things. You know, for there to be a recollection of Danish colonialism and imperialism in the Danish present would require a complexity that most of, I would argue, the mainstream politicians are not interested in. Mm -hmm. the, from what I understand very little, the constitution of Danish subjectivity does not involve colonialism, does not involve enslavement. Danes seem to have this really wonderful fiction, at least mainstream Danish uh, politics seems to have this wonderful fiction that Denmark is this kind of unified, cohesive, you know, space and the rest of the world is on some bullshit and we're all Danes and <laughs> fuck, what are we going to do with these outsiders? Well, that's, that's only possible if, that's only possible if we pretend the Danes have never left Denmark. I don't know, I just, <laughs> well, I mean, but I don't know, I just, I always, the joke is, you could be at the bottom of a fucking mine in Peru and you will encounter a Danish person. <laughs> it's, and then just at the level of, at the level of, at the level of what we would call neoliberal capital. There's 130 corporations, Danish corporations in Vietnam. The fuck are 130 Danish corporations doing in Vietnam? Well, we know what the fuck they're doing in Vietnam. They are predating the way neoliberal corporations do. They're behaving in their usual predatory models. And so this fiction that all of us as nations have, whether it's the United States or whether it's Denmark, that, that we're just our kind of space and that these other maps that show us who we really are, those maps are irrelevant, that they're fake news, that we shouldn't constitute ourselves. But I don't know, a map of Denmark doesn't look like Denmark. A map of Denmark needs to include the stupid wars y'all get into. It needs to include why the fuck is your why the fuck is your incredibly violent capitalism all over the world? What the hell are so many Danish people doing freely traveling all over the planet while they're at home arguing that nobody should travel in their place or inhabit their place? But there's just there's but but the same thing is the true for the United States, is that we draw maps of our national identity that are not accurate, they are alibis. And they are there to be alibis so that we can be innocent of the crimes we committed or innocent of what we have done, even if it doesn't rise to the occasion of crime. And the United States is very true. Most Americans are like, America, fuck yeah. Well, I'm like, well, we got over 120 something bases in over 120 something countries. Where does America end? Therefore, as artists, it's for me more interesting as an artist to be engaged at that level of complexity. The predator, the violator, the rapist has the privilege of not remembering. That's the advantage of being a predator. A predator never remembers. All these actors who attack 
assault, violate, all of these people, they're like, oh, I don't remember that. Of course you don't. Because what predator needs to remember? And I think that, again, most of us as artists, I assume the tradition of being an artist is not because you're interested in, you know, the technologies of predation, forgetting, impunity, yeah? Those things, I think, are done very well by our elders and by our corporate and political leaders. We're just trying to fill different roles. And um, this has been a lot of what uh, has gotten me thinking because uh, I, I come from a country that the United States invaded and occupied uh, on a number of occasions, and yet no American remembers, yet no Dominican forgets. And so where is the map of America? Do the predators draw the map, or do those who they predate draw the map? And certainly literature affords us new cartographies, the way music does, the way dance does, the way all the arts, I mean, fuck, if artists weren't drawing maps, we would be completely lost. And I know as a kid, I would have been entirely lost in all of these investigations if it hadn't only been for artists and scholars. I mean, shoot, I sometimes wonder. Let's talk about your literature then, because um, you talk about complexity, but what I think is really amazing about good literature and your literature is that it takes what's complex and it turns it into stories. And stories can be complex, but they're not frightening. They are human and recognizable. And I want to ask you to just read a little bit uh, from a story that um, I thought of for two, uh, two years ago when uh, I made a dear friend, uh, Lilas, who is a Syrian refugee who came to Europe like many others at that time. And when she told me what it had been like to move into a Danish provincial town, Esnes, she's a single mom with her two boys, and kind of... <laughs> Yikes! Yeah. That's, that's what it was like. And she's like, why are they all inside? Why don't they come out? I thought of a scene from one of your stories in Vierno. And um, it's a story about uh, arriving into the new country. And I want to ask you to just read a little bit from it. I think it's page 123. Thank you. Approximately. Yeah. <clears throat> that was a wild ass laugh, yo. I like it. <laughs> it's literally, uh, I, I'm, and I'm not taking the piss, but that's literally what I sound like right before I teach. Uh, yeah. I always, uh, I know we have some young people in the audience. I, I always tell uh, the young people that I'm encouraging to be a professor or to be on faculty. I'm like, you could never be worse than me, so knock yourself the fuck out. On that note, I'll read you these two little paragraphs. Yeah. From the top of Westminster, our main strip, you could see the thinnest sliver of ocean cresting the horizon to the east. My father had been shown that sight. The management showed everyone. But as he drove us in from JFK, he did not stop to point it out. The ocean might have made us feel better considering what else there was to see. London Terrace itself was a mess. Half the building still needed their wirings, and in the evening light, these structures sprawled about like ships of brick that had run aground. Mud followed gravel everywhere, and the, glass, the grass, plant, planted late in the fall, poked out of the snow in dead tufts. Each building has its own laundry my father explained. My mother looked vaguely out the snout of her parka and nodded. That's wonderful, she said. I was watching the snow sift over itself, terrified, and my brother was cracking his knuckles. This was our first day in the States. The world was frozen solid. Yeah. Oh, Jersey. Jersey. Thank you. 
can you talk a little bit about um, this state that uh, the boys in this story is just about to enter right now, which is the state of the immigrant, uh, of the person who kind of carries around two worlds at the same time while being in a place that only carries around one, at least it, it feels uh, like that. Can you talk about um, what it is about that way of being in the world that uh, appeals to you in, in your writing? Well, yeah. Um, again, I, I, my own experience of immigrating to the United States was uh, a little shocking. I, I have nephews and um, cousins now who, you know, the YouTube, they, they're on that shit so much. They know more about the United States sometimes than I do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I immigrated to the United States in 1974. It's like, you know, um, I had no images, um, zero images of the United States. I grew up, I only had a TV um, in our neighborhood for like a few months before we immigrated. And it seemed like the only thing they fucking played was uh, these 1968 Ralph Batchy Spider-Man cartoons. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have much of a glimpse of it. So America was a bit of a surprise. Um, and New Jersey more so. Um, and I, I was very curious as an artist to, could I possibly capture some of this? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, especially when one is a child, since one doesn't have any precedent, one assumes that this is what happens. Yeah, like when you're six years old, you assume that This always happens, that you're, one day you're living in Santo Domingo and the next day you're living in Parlin, New Jersey. You're just like, eh, that's what's going to happen. You naturalize what itself is an incredible disruption. And, um, and it was fascinating. I mean, later I began to understand what the fuck had happened. <laughs> But at that time, it was like uh, time travel plus being on a rocket ship at one time, you know, plus the 70s. <laughs> you know? And trying to come to terms with some of these things, you know, um, I think was real interesting for me. I, uh, um, despite what people think, uh, English is a fucking shitty language to try to learn. Uh, lots of Danes seem to speak fucking English, but uh, I found English to be incredibly difficult. Uh, really, really difficult. Not least of all because of the size of its syllabary, like its vocabulary is immense. <laughs> And um, yeah, and that was a shocker. And then I also found out that, you know, America had really strange shit that people do. You've got to learn so much as a kid when you're an immigrant. I, I often think that our societies spend so much time talking about immigrants so that we don't ever fucking have to listen to their stories. <laughs> you know, I mean, America, y'all know, the United States is like Denmark. It's talk so much about immigrants. But in some ways, it's to take up the whole conversation. It's like, it's both the United States and I assume Denmark, it's like we're still in this middle of this trial. Should we put all immigrants in concentration camps or should we not? You know, jury's still fucking out. But a part of that is, you know, it's because it would be very difficult to actually listen to immigrants. Why is it difficult to listen to immigrants? The same reason our societies, even in a society as enlightened as Denmark, doesn't want to listen to women. What's the reason? Because people who don't have the historical power have information to bring about a society that society doesn't really want to hear. I mean, even in Denmark, which has its, you know, vaunted egalitarianism, if every fucking dude shut up for a year, you would learn shit about yourself you'd never learned. <laughs> um, I promise you. I promise you. Y'all like Bernie Sanders' utopia, but you'd learn some shit. And I think it's the same thing. If every single person who wasn't an immigrant would shut the fuck up about immigration, for a year and listen to immigrants, I think this society would learn stuff about itself that most societies don't want to hear. 
Most societies don't want to hear. We don't want to hear that we are not friendly. And we don't want to hear that we are not good. And we don't want to hear that in fact, we are not hospitable. That is very difficult. Now, what we want to hear is gratitude. All I want from you is fucking gratitude. And why we demand gratitude from immigrants is so that we therefore never have to practice it. We extract so much shit from poor people, from women, from folks who are, have disabilities, from everybody who's on the receiving end of our crap. We want them to be grateful so that we can hide how much we have earned from them. And so, you know, again, as a kid, I spent my entire childhood being told, be grateful. And when you're, when every word out of your mouth is you being grateful, how can you tell the fucking truth? As children, we hear this, right? Our parents will put their foot in our ass and they're like, be grateful. And many of us are 50 years old and we're still figuring out how do we tell the truth about our parents? How do we tell the truth about our childhoods? I mean, shit, you're lucky if you're not, if you're in a relationship and your partner isn't still wrestling with what it meant to be in their family. Gratitude chokes the truth out of people. And um, this was also an important thing for me to work myself out as an immigrant because, you know, most immigrants have children and most children are caught in the double bind of being children and immigrant in societies that doesn't want to hear from either. You're the most disqualified from bearing knowledge. You're the most disqualified from bearing truth. A child's word is rarely held up in a court of law of anything. Yet, as an artist, I think that most of us really are interested in these disavowed voices. And I want to ask you about this um, being caught up between two cultures, because it's also often how uh, migrant literature is described, how your literature is described, and of course that is part of what it is. But I also get the sense with your characters that they are also wiser, that they also have an extra layer with which to look at the same world as everyone else, because they're from somewhere else, or because they have this other reference, mm. you know? Um, but it's a layer of reflection that I also just think gives something that's almost the opposite energy from the gap, from the constriction of being caught. It's also a way to tell stories. That's the way it feels when, uh, when I read your books. Can you recognize that? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, think epis, I think epistemic privilege is real. You know, I think that what we call epistemic privilege, this idea that when we, I was saying earlier that women have information about this society, that the society because needs to hear, because this is epistemic privilege. Those of us who are at disadvantages understand the society better than people who are at advantage. Mm -hmm. If I was an, look, if I was an alien and I needed to, understand this society. I wouldn't be fucking speaking to anyone with money or power. You just round up 10 or 12 people who are having shitty lives and they can draw a better map for you than anyone who's got regular meals. And certainly, this is for real, yeah. But part of the distortion and part of what really interests me as a writer is that these moments of clarity that we often get because we are marginalized right? Um, we have these what we call productive marginalizations. is almost always undermined because being marginalized is fucking hard work. You know, you can have insights, but when you're working these 60-hour-a-week jobs like I was working when I was a kid, that insight doesn't go very far. You're too fucking tired. And so you oscillate with sometimes catching a glimpse of the society and at other times never being able to see anything. I mean, I still remember my fucking older sister saying to me, you know, as she was raising her two children by herself, she's like, every now and then I remember that I am smart. And the exhaustion 
of the structures of our lives sometimes undermine these things. And for me, when I think of these characters, I think of them in that way, is that sometimes they have some insights that are piercingly important, but almost always they're undone by their own emotional distortions, by the, the kind of pressure these societies put on people. Um, and again, that's what makes, for me, it makes the literature very rich. It makes the characters sort of textural lives rich, you know? It certainly defines what I felt my childhood was. You know, when I was in college, I, uh, you know, college was weird because we worked so goddamn fucking hard and we had so little money. Every now and then we were so fucking brilliant and then we would be like, shit, I'm out of rent money, <laughs> you know? And that takes up all your energy. You know? Or shit, what am I gonna do next? And I, I find that, that moment that space to be uh, at least a place that I'm drawn to as, a, as an artist. It's a defining space or a, a space in which you test and become yourself in your ways. Yeah, no, it's the, it's, the, it's the site of great struggle. You know, few are the people who find spaces where they have an enormous realm of deliberation, where they have endless time to be, to think, to create. Most of us are earning this stuff by cutting other parts of ourselves off. I want to talk more to you about America, but can we just talk a little bit about sex? Yeah. For someone who's seen as a sort of political and activist writer, and for someone who's a public intellectual and so on, your books are full of sex. What is, what's up with that? Well, I actually think they're much more full of... Um, Intimacy, you know, I'm not so sure there's a lot of sex acts described. <laughs> the uh, actual act. Yeah, I mean, it's not that, I just... Um, the longings. And, and the ways that certain characterological sexualizations can enter into narratives, you know, there's certain ways that people think about the world. It can be highly sexualized and... Um, Certainly that's something that um, if you grew up hegemonically male, if you grew up with the kind of the standard masculinity of whatever society it is, uh, it's often that usually comes for free as part of the kit. Um, I, with me, it was just... Intimacy is such a fantastic space where most of us reveal ourselves or are terrified to reveal ourselves. Um, it is in people's intimate lives, in the ways that we long, in the ways that we connect or don't connect, in the ways that we succeed, in the way we fail, that so much is revealed. You know, think about race. Think about how race works. You could study race all day long, um, but if you leave out how racialized the sexual economy of our world is, you lose out an enormous sense of the way race works. Yeah. Um, in intimacy, so much crap gets played out. So much crazy shit. Like, it's almost as if all the force fields of the lies that we tell ourselves begin to become undone. Um, and because of course, deep down, we're constantly fed all these stories about intimacy that don't really work all that well in the real world, you know? Um, and, and, and those of us who begin to engage in intimacy when we're in high school, when we're in college, we begin to realize that for intimacy to work, we have to fucking stop lying. And most of us are so busy lying to ourselves, we couldn't imagine any other way. Who the fuck wants to reveal to themselves that they're not as smart as they think they are, that they're not as cute as they think they are, that they're not as kind as they think they are. You know? That in fact, what they learned from love was almost nothing from their parents or from their society. That mostly what they have are dreams secondhand given to them by storytellers. And it's tough 
It's tough. Most of us get in bed with each other with masks on. And how long it takes to take masks off. Now, of course, there's differences, yeah. This society encourages women to take their masks off as soon as possible for very complicated reasons, yeah. Um, but those of us who've been to this, you know, to this pony show know that, like, <laughs> the closest you can come to any form of telepathy, the closest you come to getting outside of your subjectivity is in deep intimacy. And that is a strange place for us because my God, to reveal yourself to someone else who can then take that revelation and destroy you with it. No, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible challenge. Yeah, it's a terrible challenge. And there should be awards given because so many of us do it despite the risks. And for me, it's not so much. When my friends at my age are like, oh, love, it's so hard, this shit doesn't work, it's so hard to find somebody, I'm always like, it's amazing it works at all, given how flawed we are as humans. We're all flawed. It's, there's nothing wrong with us. It's just, it's hard. We're in a hard world, and we have very vulnerable hearts. And uh, for me, it's always been a, a great utopian sight because given how little we learn about love, given what this world teaches us, and it's so cruel what it teaches us, and given how often we are failed by our parents and by the adults in our lives, through sometimes no fault of their own, that so many of us still find the energy to get in there and to give it a fucking try. Uh, speaks well of us. And as an artist, I was taught that boys shouldn't be interested in stories about intimacy. And as an artist, you can't help it. You know, if, as soon as they tell you you shouldn't be interested in that, you need to run for it. <laughs> I was like, I come from a military family. You could read all three of my books and never have a sense of what a military family I come from. Yeah. I come from a family where all of that shit was just completely rejected. My family was shooting firearms every weekend. It was boxing every weekend. Um, everything but vulnerability. Yeah, we were the, the Dominican version of the Fry Corps, you know? <laughs> Impenetrable, homosocial, and weird, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, I think it was my rebellion in a family like mine where love was for, you know, gender traitors in some way. Mm -hmm. It was a place for me to go. So I didn't have to be with my father who just would get an erection every time he loaded his gun. That's a weird <laughs> space, yo. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Does this intimate space exist which isn't uh, about power relations, about uh, politics, about the masks? Is it like a utopia or is it there? You just have to struggle enough to get there. Utopia isn't, a st utopia isn't some state of... Tra For me, uh, apologies to all the, all the f interpretations, utopia isn't a state of transcendence. We don't put down all our human limitations. For me, intimacy isn't about that we stop being deeply flawed, scared people. It is that in spite of all these flaws, we try to manage them. I don't want to be in love with some perfect dream person. I want to be in love with somebody just like me, as fucked up and scared, but who is at least making an effort to manage them. And I think the dream of transcendence has been one of the most troubling radiations to come out of the project of the Enlightenment. And it continues to haunt us. You know, and certainly haunts us in love. Yeah. But there's also something about uh, images of something that looks like intimacy that is very, that shakes you. And I'm saying this because we went down and saw uh, the exhibition that Lisa was talking about just now, about the blind angles of 
Danish colonial history. And the image that uh, I've remembered ever since it opened is the image that's also on the posters for it, and it's of a Caribbean nanny sitting with a small white Danish girl. And it's a, a photo that looks intimate in a parental way almost, but it isn't necessarily, we don't know, of course, we don't know what the reality behind the photo is. But when we were looking at it, you were also talking about questions about intimacy that are raised by a picture like that. What, were you th what did you think when you saw it? Uh, well, I mean, I think one of the primary, uh, one of the, look, one of the, for me, one of the primary extracts of exploitation is effective labor. In other words, emotional labor. The fact that how many, if we just take it from a sort of a simplistic gender binary, how many women do an enormous amount of effective labor? They're like, hey, I'm a dude. I'm like, why don't you carry my fucking nervous system for me? <laughs> and if, if, I, again, even in Bernie Sanders' Danish utopia, so I, have a, I have a bunch of Danish friends, and let me tell you, y'all, a lot of the women are doing a lot of effective labor here. <laughs> yeah, and so, I, and, and take it to a racial modality. The, we were talking earlier about immigration. Look, when we're talking about immigration at a place like Denmark or the United States, we're talking about race. It's a polite term. Immigration is profoundly racialized. Part of the reason we're demanding gratitude from immigrants is because we want them to do effective labor. We're like, we're going to hate you, but you're going to learn to love us. There's a fair fight. And when you hate us, we're going to blame you for hating us. All right, that sounds fair. And the same way that we see in the enslavement period, uh, the gender division, the amount of effective labor that enslaved women had to do in these economies was enormous, and it continues to play itself out. I mean, you can see the echoes of this uh, at every stage. I mean, for those of us who've been to New York, it seems like half of fucking Denmark's been to New York, but I just, the amount of colored nannies who do this effective labor in these wealthy and even sometimes just affluent communities. And I think that in a situation where your community doesn't have parity of power, there can be no real effective relationships. These are just bizarre distortions. Yeah, that you need certain kinds of parity. And when you get these yawning, um, abysmal inequalities, like you see in slavery, um, we can't even begin to talk about that as human relationships. These things are almost demonic, what's being demanded of enslaved people to perform these kinds of work. And let me tell you, it is hard to convince people that effective labor is an exploitation, that our emotional energies are finite. And when we take certain groups and ask them to do emotional work for a society that is unfair and unequal. We're taking parts of people's souls, but we don't have any calibers to measure this. And yet this, I think, will be something that in, we imagine in the future when folks become, I would argue, more sophisticated, that this will be one of the great crimes that our societies will be remembered for that we commit effective crimes on people, that we ask people to love those that hate them, 
that we ask people to graft their invincible and infinite affections onto criminals. That's, that's the remarkable thing that we do. And we'll pay for that, I promise you. We're, this, this can't go without a reckoning. Yeah. So just explain to me this parity of power, because I'm thinking, will there ever be this parity of power? Like, if I um, want to um, go to work and uh, have someone help me raise my kids by being paid to look after them, am I then, in no matter what the circumstances surrounding that, Am I then robbing them of their effective resources? Or are there ways in which we can help each other with bringing up our kids in, in groups? Uh... Well, of course we are. I mean, of course we are. But look, the situation isn't that we're not all inside of a contradiction. We live in a society that we are all inside of contradictions. Nobody's got their hands clean. Show me a single person anywhere in the world who isn't complicit in some sort of madness. For me, the issue is less that this is a simple thing of am I a criminal or not. The, the issue is that we can begin to think about this in sophisticated ways, therefore permit ourselves to begin to imagine and create remedies that would be more useful to us. For me, guilt is, is useless because there's, there's better ways for us to act. Are we robbing people's effective labor? Well, sure, we're robbing people's labors all the time. These are the contradictions of our society. Even when we pay them? Well, it depends on what we're paying them. The, the issues are always around, is there fair recompense? And in societies where effective laborers are not organized, there's scarcely going to be any recompense. You know, if effective laborers don't have a union, and if it's not recognized as a central labor, uh, it's going to be a tough issue. But I'm saying this from personal experience. I come from a very poor Dominican family, and yet there's always somebody more poor than us. And my mother was always able to find somebody who was far poorer than we were to help her. And I lived in this economy, and it made me give me things to think about. Our complicity should be there to energize us towards strategizing better ways of being. Complicity is not there to shut us all down. It's, we're all in this bullshit. Some of us eat better than the others, sure. Some of us benefit more than the others, but these systems are here to imprison us all. Some people think that because they're wardens, they're free, they're not. And uh, it, it's going to take a lot for us to get around this stuff. Yeah. But again, it's, it's one of those things where uh, it, there's nothing very heroic about thinking about these things. You know? I think a lot of times we're, we're, we, we're told not to think too much about them, but I'm always curious. Yeah. That makes you curious. <laughs> I'm always curious. <laughs> I watched my mom hire somebody to raise us, and then I watched my mom, when I was a teenager, be hired to raise other people's children, mm -hmm. and it makes you curious. So give us your advice. I mean, I know that, as Lisa mentioned, you, you said in Politiken the other day that you found it a little odd that immigration would be the biggest problem we have in, in Denmark, and I can see how coming from any other country that looks uh, perhaps unlikely, just quantitatively speaking. What is your advice if, if uh, people here want to participate in being better at, you know, being better at being engaged in a multicultural society in which we handle all these complexities? What's the best advice for that? Again, I, 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 I'm an artist, I'm no expert, but then again, we all seem to put non-experts in charge of shit, so, <laughs> you know. Look, I, I, I'm always stuck in the same situation. I, we have a ton of fucking young people who, we can say all we want about young people, but there is not a 17-year-old in this room 
who couldn't fucking run America better than Donald Trump. <laughs> Give me a fucking break. And so that's not, and that's not to damn the 17 year old with, cha- with, you know, with small praise. There's, we're in a situation where our societies, our politics are being organized to console the elderly. The politics of the United States and Denmark are consolations for old people (laughs) who fear a shrinking world, who fear an invader, who fear A, B, C, D, where, for the most part, our elites are old predators who are stealing the horizons of young people. That's the truth of it. And so the issue for me is less like these issue by issue things where it's like immigration, how do we stop being so white supremacist? All these matter to me intimately, but it's certainly not going to come from having a, a society that seems to have no interest in their young people except as a way to create debt from them. Um, you know, I, and I was thinking about Denmark. I, I teach at a university system. I teach at MIT. And we have a lot of Danish refugees from the university system. I mean, this is a university system that is under neoliberal assault. This is a university system where its faculty don't feel secure, where you produce graduate students who you can't give any fucking jobs to. This society has no problems underwriting with corporate welfare its mineral corporations, but seems to not be able to find jobs for its most brilliant grad students in academia. Um, There's a lot that's going on, but I think that, as most of us know, when we belong to neoliberal societies, we're being told that the fire is over here. I mean, didn't they just throw out was it the law faculty used to be in the center of this city? Did they move the law library or something out of the city? Yeah, not too far. <laughs> not too far, yeah, okay. Well, there you go is your first step. But these are neoliberal decisions. Do, do the universities here own their own property? I don't know. They don't. If I recall, they pay rent to the government. And so when the government finds a boutique that can pay higher rent. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of weird shit around here. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of weird shit. It's a tough place to be a young person, despite what Bernie wants to say. Talk about what's changed for you after this election. Um, In, I mean, you're a public intellectual, you're a professor, you're a writer, but you're also an American man in the middle of a country that's undergoing some wild transformations. What has that meant for the way you're living your life at the moment? Well, you know, um, nobody wants to live when fucking Trump is around. Who the hell wants that? (laughs) You know, but, you know, to quote Lord of the Rings, uh, (laughs) we can't choose the time that we're born in. Uh, We can't choose the struggle that's handed to us. You know, fortunately for me, I've always been sort of a member of the kind of the pugnacious, let's get organized, uh, solidarity, uh, struggle. (laughs) I'm all into that shit. So I didn't like it. It's not fun to have America's white supremacist chapters all energized and activated. Um, And for those of us who wanted to live the dream that America was America minus the KKK, it's been harder to live that dream. Um, The centrality of white supremacy in so many of our societies is something that can't be argued with, and yet most people want to argue about it. Donald Trump makes that argument harder. Fortunately, a lot of people have responded with an enormous amount of fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, what else can we, uh, you know, what else can we hope for? There are other planes of existence. There's other dimensions where there's a Donald Trump in office and people are like not wanting to fight. 
Yeah, and I was thinking about that because I went to grad school when the Iraq war started in the States, and I remember this really lazy walk out from classes, and the professors were like saying, come on, guys, and people were like, nah, we like our English class, and there's almost this taboo against uh, speaking about politics among lots of the students, and it just seems like now campuses, not least, are battlegrounds. Some, some, but, you know, uh, for those of us who are kind of interested in history, it's, you never know which generation is going to tear shit up. People were saying before Black Lives Matter exploded that this was the most complacent, lame generation. These young people don't want to organize, and then Black Lives Matter explodes. And I'm like, well, what happened to all that fucking rhetoric? Yeah. I, I think it's... It, Human beings are not the Hunger Games. We never know when we're going to be heroic. We never know. It's, it's so unpredictable. And I think that that's the same surprises that brought this fucking idiot into power are the same surprises that bring certain kinds of struggle and solidarity into existence. And I, I often think, again, the emphasis that we often have on blaming the young people for they're not so energized. Why aren't they burning this shit down? I'm like, I don't know. Given the amount of pressure and the amount of just disgusting distortion that our society pumps into young people, I think they're fucking kicking ass. I think that there's plenty of us who wouldn't have held it together if we had to grow up in these neoliberal derangements. You know, we can... There's much to criticize all generations, but um, you know, we're doing as best we can. We have trillions of dollars aimed at us to shut us the fuck up, to put us the fuck to sleep, to have us only shop. Given how much money they throw at us, they're not as satisfied as you would think they are. <laughs> they're like, fuck, it ain't working. <laughs> Crank up YouTube. <laughs> Instagram, anything. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's difficult. There are challenges. I'm not underselling the challenges. But you're saying that something is in the air. There's things happening around. I, a couple hundred years ago, I was owned by people. <laughs> a couple hundred years ago, no one in my community of African descent was permitted to have intimacy with whom they wanted to. It all depends what your context is, what's possible. I belong to a community that overthrew the greatest empires in the world with very little. Perhaps it's just foolish of me to think that we're still in the place where we can do the same thing. But that's perhaps because I... I believe strongly in the lessons of the ancestors that live inside of all of us. This, they are not unbeatable, and they've never been. We show this again and again, again and again. They rise up, and again and again we fight. There is no end. There is no transcendence. We are not going to cure human beings. The fight will go on. And we have to just accept that that's part of our cycle. Some years we get fucking neoliberal, warmongering, immigrant-hating Obama. Some years we get warmongering, neoliberal, immigrant-hating Donald Trump. <laughs> we just keep fighting. You know, some years we get very lucky, too. So I'm all about that shit. So... I can see how there's something really encouraging about some kinds of consensus not working anymore, because at least Donald Trump has made that, I don't know, he's made things very clear in a way where it's been easier to see that not everyone is going to like buy into this system. But I also have a feeling, and this may be white privilege speaking, that people are not there's not a lot of common ground, a lot of conversations go wrong at the moment. A lot of uh, 
Mm, a lot of people say we don't have anything in common. This is a sense in the air of disillusion or to, I don't know what it is, but and it could be just my white angst, or it could be some uh, reaction against, um, you know, lies falling down about our shared wonderful Western <laughs> civilization project. But do you recognize the feeling that? Again, I, I think it's convenient that, um, I, I mean, yes, it is probably your white privilege. <laughs> yes, but, but that's all right, because I, I just think it's convenient when we demographically have more young people on the planet than we've ever had before, that we have all of these narratives and discourses of exhaustion. It's just really convenient. Yeah, I just, I, I guess, again, look, it's hard to have a political defeat. It's hard to reconstitute oneself when one feels that one gets kicked in the teeth. It is. It is hard to actually mourn it. But there is, again, this is probably crazy of me, but I just, I don't know, I'm not that impressed, I'm not that convinced that human beings have changed so overwhelmingly and that this, these societies were so fantastic 10 years ago. It's, yes, we are in a contested place. Yes, there's a lot of fucked up bullshit, but it's never been cute. These places have never been fucking cute. Um, and I, I just, I don't understand why the presence of Donald Trump has panicked everyone. You would think fucking Morgoth has come back. You would think like the Dark Lord is <coughs> chilling. This is, a, this is a dude who can barely fucking add, yo. Nothing wrong. I'm sorry for people who can't add. <laughs> God, not to damn with faint praise, but I guess I'm, maybe it's because I'm a Mets fan. For those of you who don't know anything about baseball, I'm on the side of a team that never wins. <laughs> I'm I'm used to looking at people with power and being like, let's fuck them up. <laughs> what else is there? And so I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. I was in a country where there was a civil war. And yes, we're really good at tearing ourselves apart, especially when we're the closest to each other. We're especially good at inventing fissures. Um, but I've also seen that a country like the Dominican Republic that had a very violent, very bad, very just long-lasting, acrimonious civil conflict, um, there's still abilities for people to create different kinds of solidarities. The future is unfucking written I just think it's so hard for us to seed the truth about the future. And the truth about the future is that none of us, and as a writer, I'm always really interested in this, that none of us know what the future needs. I write a book, and it doesn't make a difference that I get invited to Denmark and people are like, oh, I've read it. In 40 years, nobody could know anything about me. The future has the final vote, and it is very difficult for us to allow that. We think that there's something about the present that gives us special knowledge about the future. But that is a fantasy. You know, we're in our present. We've got our challenges. We have to do our fight. But the future, six months before Trump got elected, you had no idea Trump was getting elected. Mm -hmm. Well, if the bad can surprise us, so can the progressive. You know? And yet you've just edited a special edition of the Boston Review about global dystopias. I like that shit, yeah. <laughs> Why do you like dystopias? That's crazy. Well, we live in dystopias, so I feel like it's a vocabulary we're familiar with. Yeah. Um, I, again, I just think you, dystopias are, are, are... and They are discursive instruments par excellence for understanding our society and for imagining better places. Tom Moylan always said the you know, critical dystopias, their function is to map, to warn, and to hope. And that has been the use of dystopias forever. 
You know, you show people a bad society, people are like, oh shit, just like my bad society. Um, oh, this is how bad societies function? Hmm, perhaps it's possible for us to overthrow bad societies. Dystopias are great because if you live in the United States or in the Western world, you're told that any future that doesn't include capitalism is unimaginable. And dystopias, some of them imagine futures with no capitalism. <laughs> and even better, some of them imagine futures with no America. <laughs> I think it's good to imagine futures with no America. <laughs> you know, the same way it's good to imagine futures with no men and no white people. Not because we're encouraging shit, <laughs> but because as thought experiments, they're very, Thank very you. useful. I just, I, I, I can't help it. I look at my students when I'm in class, and I keep thinking, fuck, you know what the best thing would happen to you right now is? If every single person over the age of 32 fell asleep for eight months. <laughs> It'd be a fucking, it, honestly, I don't care what you say, we, we wouldn't wake up to a worse society. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just smoke too much weed, but that's me. <laughs> no. So I was going to ask you what's your favorite dystopia at the moment, but did we just hear it? No, that wouldn't be it. That's kind of a utopia. <laughs> um, yeah. I, again, I, I sort of um, I reveal my bald age because I'm a huge fan of Octavia Butler's Dawn. I think it's the greatest dystopia ever and then for the kind of the the little ultra leftist in me v for vendetta alan moore's comic book mm -hmm. you know you don't always get an anarchist hero who fights white supremacists all day long that's great too i like that <laughs> you know? so those are two if you haven't read octavia butler's dawn you really should i think it's one of the greatest novels of all time What's great about it? I know lots of people here have probably seen and even read uh, The Handmaid's Tale, and I know you interviewed Margaret Atwood about it, and that was it, the critical dystopia, right? That Big did time. exactly what you were just describing. Does Octavia Butler do the same, a similar, is that a similar? Very surprise? much so, yeah. very much so. I, I think it's one of the great books of all time. It imagines what would happen if, um, what would happen if, uh, we found ourselves, all of us, victims of an alien invasion that what they wanted from us was our genes. And how they get them is that they insert themselves into the intimate space between people. And it's the most disturbing thing I've ever read. <laughs> Highly, it's like erotic vampires, really terrifying. <laughs> yeah. But it's so great on white supremacy and slavery. It's like, if you want a great x-ray of American history, That's Dawn is not a bad place to start. I'm, I'm curious about this because I was just rereading your books preparing for this and I hadn't seen that Oscar Wilde loves like the apocalypse. He loves sort of superheroes destroying the, well, I guess saving the world and villains destroying the world. And I guess uh, in that sense, he's uh, a close relative of, of yours then. Well, I, I, when I write my characters, I tend to give them different loves than mine. It's useful that your characters don't love the same books you do. Mm -hmm. At least for me, I can't keep track of them if they do. Mm -hmm. you know? and, um, and, I, and I like writing about people who like books. Mm -hmm. I've always found readers, again, everyone has their different bag. I have a beloved mentor, uh, the writer, scholar, critic, Samuel R. Delaney, mm -hmm. and he always makes it clear. He's like, ah, oh, anytime you see my characters, they're always falling in love with people with really beaten up hands. And I, I find people with good books on their shelves very attractive. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to make my characters, even the bad ones, somehow textually involved. Yeah, textually involved. I'm also just wondering if that's bringing us back to, to where we started, which uh, in the sense that 
the deliberate forgetting of stuff is kind of what you're struggling, and it's, it seems this dealing with dystopias uh, is also something you find healthy. It's kind of an act against forgetting, looking away, that in itself, instead of being afraid, just look it in the eye and, and use art for that. Is that like a survival mm. <laughs> survival mechanism? Even? Survival or, or uh, a sense of creation and hope. Look, I, whether we're talking about whiteness, maleness, straightness, ability, we're really talking about the poles of privilege. At their heart is the fantasy of innocence. Denmark's like America. Both of these places think they're fucking innocent. They think everybody else has committed a crime. They're like, all these immigrants have committed a crime. All these fucking black people on the bus, they're criminals. All these fucking Syrians trying to get across our border, they're fucking criminals. And the, the nature of innocence is that to maintain an identity of innocence requires forgetting and requires amnesia. You have to create alibis for yourself. Nations, especially nations that have whiteness at their heart, they cannot exist without the dream of innocence. We, darker bodies, are criminalized. The nation is innocent of all crimes. And this, for me, is not insignificant. If you want to be an artist, you have to understand how a society works because you are going to be drawing them, mapping them. And if you are unaware of how important innocence is, even if you're just writing about your characters falling into bed with each other, you're not going to understand the basic social gravity of your story worlds. And I take this concept of innocence and map it out over my male characters all day long. They think they're fucking innocent. And they slowly discover, for better and for worse, that this innocence is an ideological project to take out the ability for people to understand what's really, really happening. And that's good. That's sort of, uh, I think, part of what we call this Gnostic project of removing the veils. I think if, if you're not, as an artist, unless in my mind, if you're not trying desperately to remove those veils, to remove, in the Gnostic terms, to remove that, you know, that Orientalist vision that they have, to kind of take the scales from your eyes, it's, it's, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. We, 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 we must understand clearly. And um, to understand clearly as an artist means that you have to undo a lot of the negative education. They call it negative hallucination for a reason. Negative hallucination is how our societies teach us to unsee. And we have to do a lot of relearning that unseeing. You know, for us to begin to really understand where we're at and who we're at, who we are. So. I think you just uh, gave a really good reason to go downstairs after this and check out the exhibition. It's a wonderful, disturbing. Yeah. And um, I also think um, you said something that leads us to the last... Um, paragraph from your book that I would ask you to read uh, as a final part of this conversation, um, because uh, this is a story about Junior suddenly facing some of uh, the violence underneath his feet, as I read it. Mm. And um, I just want to yeah, thank you for this talk and just ask you to read us uh, a couple of paragraphs about Junior's experience. Yeah, and thank you so much for being my interlocutor. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for being so very patient and very kind. So I'll just <laughs> read this and then everybody run home and get drunk. Um, <laughs> or not. Uh, yeah. So all you have to know is my protagonist, dumbass, um, his girlfriend 
catches him cheating, and so he's crying because he thinks he's innocent. <laughs> and uh, he's running around with some bucket heads, and so here we go. And they're at a, a cave in the Dominican Republic that the vice president of the country is trying to convince this young character who has run into the vice president for reasons that are never explained, that, uh, that if he looks into this cave, he will have visions that will help him clarify where he's at, All right? Would you like to see inside, the vice president asks me. I must have said yes, because his bodyguard, Barbaro, gives me the flashlight, and the two of them grab me by my ankles and lower me into the hole. All my coins fly out of my pockets, bendiciones. I don't see much, just some odd colors on the eroded walls, and the vice president's calling down, isn't it beautiful? This is the perfect place for insight, for a person to become something better. The vice president probably saw his future self hanging in this darkness, bulldozing the poor out of their shanties, and Barbaro, too, buying a concrete house for his mother, showing her how to work the air conditioner. But for me, all I can manage is a memory of the first time me and Magda talked back at Rutgers. We were waiting for an e-bus together on George Street, and she was wearing purple, all sorts of purple. And that's when I know it's over. As soon as you start thinking about the beginning, it is the end. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.